On the 28th of June of 1948, the delegates of the Soviet Union, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, France, and Italy voted unanimously against Yugoslavia. Now, I'm not talking about an early and underwhelming edition of the Eurovision Song Contest. This was the resolution of the Information Bureau concerning the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, June 28, 1948. One which concluded that the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia has placed itself and the Yugoslav Party outside the family of the Fraternal Communist Parties, outside the United Communist Front, and consequently outside the ranks of the Information Bureau. In other words, a joint decision of the Common Forum to expel Yugoslavia from its ranks. This formalized once and for all a rift that was at least two years in the making. I'm your host David, and this week we're going to take a look at the split between Moscow and Belgrade, between Stalin and Tito. This is the Cold War. Shout out to Magellan TV, who is kindly sponsoring this episode. Magellan is an incredible streaming service run by filmmakers that have over 2,000 documentaries. We've been working our way through Magellan's current history documentaries playlist, and the current documentary we're on is called North Korea Hidden Revolution. These documentaries do a great job of highlighting all different aspects of modern history and are recommended to the fans of the Cold War era. You can stream the documentaries anywhere from your phone, laptop, tablet, or TV. Many new programs are added on a weekly basis, and a wide selection are available in 4K without any additional costs. If you haven't tried out Magellan yet, you have to give it a try at MagellanTV.com slash Cold War for a free one-month membership trial. Winston Churchill's seminal speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri on the 5th of March 1946 described how an Iron Curtain had descended from the Baltic to Trieste. We've talked about it before, as a matter of fact. But the so-called bloc east of that curtain was less homogenous than the West would have believed. The rivalry between Tito's Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union would be the most notable example. But how did it come about? Now, I'm sure most of you could probably wrap Stalin's life story. In Georgian. Backwards. So why don't we start with a quick overview of Tito's life instead. Joseph Broz was born on the 7th of May 1892 in Kumrovets, Croatia, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Joseph's political maturity came about during his service as a sergeant in the First World War, where he realized that Vienna's army was more suited to repress Slavic minorities, peasants and workers, rather than fighting an actual war. While serving on the Eastern Front, Sergeant Broz was wounded in a cavalry charge and spent the rest of the war as a POW of, well, as a guest of the Russians. During this period, he came in contact with Bolshevik ideology, renouncing his affiliation with Austria-Hungary. Now, it wasn't until October 1920 that he returned to Croatia, now part of the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, later better known as Yugoslavia. On his return, Josip Broz joined the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, or CPY. He thrived in this job. By 1928, he was appointed party secretary for Zagreb by the Comintern. After a stint in prison for possession of explosive material, Josip Broz was promoted to national CPY leadership. On this occasion, he adopted his distinctive pseudonym, Tito. In 1937 and 1938, Stalin launched his campaign of purges against political and military leaders in the USSR, which through the common turn, extended to other communist parties across Europe. The CPY was not exempt, and party secretary Milan Gorkic was executed. Tito made it through the purges unscathed. Even better, he benefited from them, receiving an appointment as the new CPY secretary directly from Moscow. According to some sources, such as journalist Pero Simic, Tito actively denounced some of his comrades during the purges to climb to power. After the Axis invasion of Yugoslavia in the Second World War, 
Tito had the opportunity to emerge as the main resistance leader. When the monarchist Serbian Chetniks partnered with the Italian occupation forces in an anti-communist alliance, the Allies switched their support to Tito's fighters. His force was so effective that by November 1943, they controlled much of Bosnia. In February 1944, Adolf Hitler ordered his favorite henchman, Otto Skorzeny, to locate and assassinate Tito. While they did locate him, Tito and his fighters were able to hold off and eventually escape the most dangerous man in Europe. Yugoslavia was completely liberated from Axis forces in May 1945. Unlike other Eastern European countries, the contribution of the Red Army had been minimized, a factor which limited Moscow's influence over the country's internal affairs. In November of that year, Tito took full control of the country, exiled the king, and declared the republic, although it would be fairer to describe it more like a dictatorship. His first years in power were particularly brutal. In order to consolidate his power, Tito started purging in pure Stalin style. In fact, up until that resolution of June 1948, Tito appeared to the eyes of the West as a minor Stalin of the Balkans, and Yugoslavia seemed like a tight ally of the Soviets. Consider this for example. In July 1947, Britain and France attempted to convene a conference with Eastern European countries to discuss an extension of the Marshall Plan beyond the curtain. Tito's denial was the first and most resolute in line with the diktats from Moscow. Stalin imposed a blanket refusal of the Marshall Plan, establishing instead the common forum as an alternative. But we know there was a falling out. So why did Tito and Stalin stop being BFFs? Well, we can look at two sets of reasons. One ideological, one geopolitical. Let's start with ideology. On the 18th of March 1948, the Foreign Policy Department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, like a bad Yelp review, compiled a memorandum accusing the CPY of ignoring Marxist-Leninist principles. What were the reasons for this bad review? Well, as per official party line, Tito was expected to apply measures for collectivization of the land, in other words, expropriation, even by violent means, of farms, property of small landowners known as kulaks by the Soviets. These were to be replaced by newly created collective farms. Tito's approach was to create instead agricultural cooperatives. This was not just an embellished tag for just another kolkhoz. Yugoslavian farmers could retain ownership of their lands as well as part of their crops. Tito and his deputy Edvard Kardej defended this plan by claiming that it was an intermediary step to fulfill collectivization and that it was indeed a Marxist-Leninist concept, only applied to Yugoslavian specific national characteristics. So that's the ideology. Now for the geopolitics. In January 1948, Tito had initiated secret talks with Albanian communist leader, the bunker builder himself, Enver Hoxha, to establish a Yugoslavian military base in Korch. The aim was to protect Albania from the monarchical fascists in Greece, then locked in civil war against the communists. This move immediately caught Stalin's attention. Moscow interpreted this move as an attempt of Tito's to expand his influence over Albania and even incorporate it into the Yugoslavian Federation. The whole Albanian affair was tightly linked to Tito's involvement in the Greek Civil War. We've already covered this conflict, its international implications, and let's just say complications. I will only add that in October of 1944, Stalin and Churchill had reached the so-called percentages agreement regarding respective spheres of influence in Greece. Stalin had graciously agreed that Greece would be within Britain's range, and he intended to honor that agreement. Even after the end of World War II, even after the Iron Curtain had cast its shadow, Stalin was not too keen to alienate Western interests in the Mediterranean. That's why he did not offer support to the DAG, the communist side in the Civil War, and he expected the other common forum members to do the same. But Tito, keen to extend his influence in the region, actively supported the DAG by providing with weapons from the winter of 1946 
to the summer of 1947, as well as bases inside Yugoslavian territory. And here Stalin had a perception problem. Even though the Soviet Union was not directly involved in Greece, he understood that the Western Bloc, especially the US, may not be able to make such a subtle distinction. If a communist Eastern European country supported the Greek communists, then it must have been Stalin's will. The communist resurgence in Greece, in fact, prompted US President Harry Truman to seek approval from Congress to provide financial and military assistance to the monarchical fascists, to put it in Tito's terms. But what really did worry Stalin was an interview released by Bulgarian communist leader Georgi Dimitrov to the New York Times in January of 1948. In it, Dimitrov spoke of a larger Balkan federation to also include Greece. So was that Tito's game? Impose himself as a regional superpower bent on the annexation of Albania and Greece? That was the last straw that broke the Georgian camel's back. Soviet Foreign Affairs Minister Molotov summoned Karl Dej to Moscow in February 1948 for a dressing down. Stalin himself lectured him on the risks of upsetting the balance in Greece, and especially of upsetting US interests in the Mediterranean. And on the 18th, he forced Karl Dej to sign a declaration according to which Yugoslavia would have to consult the Soviet Union before taking any foreign policy initiative. But the Man of Steel was not entirely unsympathetic to Tito's confederation desires. He even strongly suggested that Yugoslavia unite with Bulgaria rather than Albania or Greece. Tito being Tito, he didn't react favorably to the rap on the knuckles from Headmaster Drugashvili. First, he dismissed the idea of merging with Bulgaria, considering the country to be a Trojan horse for the Soviets. Then, on the 21st of February, Tito met with Nicholas Zakariadis, General Secretary of the Greek Communist Party, and agreed to continue supporting his partisans. Finally, on the 1st of March, Tito declared at a plenary session of the CPY that Yugoslavia would not forego their presence in and their influence over Albania. Shortly afterwards, Tito received the first of many accusatory letters from Stalin, which culminated with the common form communique of the 24th of June, 1948. The chasm was wide open. Hi, my name's Tito. I'm a newly single, having just gotten out of an abusive relationship with a controlling psychopath who didn't want me to pursue my own interests or meet with other politburos. I have two big spheres of influence. If you like my profile, swipe left. In the years that followed, Stalin's ideological grudge towards Tito soon became a personal one, and the Soviet dictator actively sought to eliminate his Balkan rival. Lavrenti Beria, head of the NKVD, was put on the case. Stalin's spy master orchestrated no less than 22 assassination attempts against Tito, which could rival in outlandishness with the CIA's plans to assassinate Castro. One of these plans involved an ornate jewelry box rigged to release a cloud of toxic nerve gas when opened. Another involved Agent Max, whose real name was Josef Grigulevich. Max was instructed to infiltrate a diplomatic reception in Belgrade posing as the Costa Rican diplomat Teodoro Castro. Once there, Max was to release his secret weapon, an outbreak of bacterial plague. Luckily for Tito, Stalin's death on the 5th of March 1953 meant that the hit was called off and Max was recalled to Moscow. Stalin's death is officially attributed to a stroke, but Slovenian historian Jose Pirjavic in his Tito and his Comrades has a different theory. He claims that Stalin may have been poisoned with potassium cyanide and that the poisoning had been ordered by none other than Tito in retaliation for the attempted assassinations against him. Could this be true? There's no solid evidence, even though Pidiavitz claims that this would be the fulfillment of Tito's famous message to Stalin. Stalin, stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured five of them, one with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send one to Moscow, and I won't have to send another." The existence of this letter, by the way, is also disputed. It really sounds too good to be true. 
But authentic or not, it captures the climate of tension and enmity amongst these two giants of post-World War II politics. Most of all, it represents the sense of defiance and independence which motivated Tito to rule his country his own way. My thanks to Arnaldo for this outstanding script. To make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have oppressed the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram at thecoldwartv. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or via YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.